to access believers and how to talk and interact with unbelievers. Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so this year uh, I want to tackle something that we've, we've tackled before, but I want to do it in a bit of a different way. So we, I want to talk about how to defend our faith as Christians. So what I want to do, and in, in of course we, we did tactics, but what I want to do is I want to handle tactics in between. So we're going to learn a bunch of stuff and then a bit of tactics and a, a bunch of stuff and a bit of tactics so that we can, that you have something to test it on, so to get in, in the um, along with that, I think the need for this is, is absolutely great. Um, during last month, I was reading a book by Rosmora Butterfield, where she, uh, Ros, Rosara Butterfield, yeah, Butterfield, where she said, um, the new, the new book she brought out is Five Lies of Our, of Our Anti-Christian Culture. And then in the, in the introduction to the book, she says, um, she needs to confess something. And her confession is, in the previous books, she wrote them as if we were in a, a culturally neutral environment, where, people, where Christians still had a voice, but it was culturally neutral, you know, that kind of idea. And she said, but she's realized of late that that is not the case. We, we are living in the midst of enemies. We, there's a, we're living in an anti-Christian culture. And I think more than ever before, it's needed for us to know how to handle it. How do we address things? And we should. No, it's, we shouldn't be quiet. We should be addressing things. We should be interacting with people. Um, along with that, I read another book um, uh, by a guy that works with homosexuals in San Francisco, a uh, Christian pastor. And the book is actually about the use of language. We said that we've been um, giving our language away as Christians. Um, constantly trying to um, almost appease the, the people around us. And by doing that, we've actually given away our position. Mm -hmm. And that we should return to the older words. He says, uh, the Bible doesn't use um, same-sex attracted as a word. It uses homosexuality as a word. Um, it, it addresses things by the naming that, that it is. And his case is that we should return back to that. We've been giving up our position. And we should say what a thing is. We should handle it for what it is. And uh, yeah, and then along with that, so many of the, I was going to say, big, of, big evangelical groups has been just moving away at such a mean space. Gospel Coalition is one that the, the view on homosexuality has, has radically changed in the last three years to such an extent that they, they, sort of dance around the issue, they don't really address it. Whereas Christians, we should address the issue, we should say, we've got something to say, we, we are to be salt and light in the world, we have to be that, and we, we're too afraid to be that. So tonight what I want to do is, I want to show the battle that we have, um, and the cost of the battle, and then I want to go and look at Romans 1 verse 18 to 32 and address the worldview that we as Christians have, like a tool basically that we can use when we do talk with people so that we can quickly figure out what's going on. And then lastly, I want to show how a small change has made a huge difference in the way that theology is, is handled and how we should, how moving back just that one little move will change quite a lot okay so um we're first going to go to 2 corinthians 10 verses 3 to 6. so in in 2 corinthians 10 verses 3 to 6 we find paul um talking about um the battle that we have now what's interesting for me is i think we are basically back in the way that it functioned in the roman the roman world i think um, if you just look at the people with their religions around us, paganism is back, full blown. Um, I, I, I thought about it when I when I was in university. I met a lady that was Wicca, and she was the only one that I knew. Now there is a multitude, even just in in Iliad and Yugi and Klee, that I can name. 
uh, it's just it's everywhere. Paganism is, is back, exactly. and then along with that, there's this pantheism. God is a spirit through everything, and sort of an energy force. That, there's all of this. We, we're living in a new pagan world again, um, pretty much the same as what Paul was addressing in, in two Corinthians. So when we look at how he handled the issues, it allows us to see how we should make our battle. Now listen to how he does this. He says in 2, uh, in 10, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 6, he says, um, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Now the first thing is, he realized we were in a war. And I think that's that's what I, I want us firstly to realize, that this is not... This is not niceties that we're busy with. Mm -hmm. We're not busy trying to just convince somebody or something. This is war. Um, if we don't convince someone properly, if we can't discuss things with them, if we don't take the time to do it, they're lost. Uh, and the enemy is busy. He, he's not just going to leave them. He'll make use of every moment. So we are in a battle. We need to be able to address these things. He says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. So in other words, it's not um, how you do battle in the world, guns and things like that. We're not Muslims. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the other picture is almost as if um, the, the, the enemy has taken stronghold. It's, it's taken a place in people's lives. And we are using divine power to attack these strongholds. Now listen to what these strongholds are. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So for Paul, the battle is a battle of mind, and, and it makes sense. Now, what, what is the description of the devil? He's called the father of lies. Now that's that's how he works. That's what he does. But as a Christian, how do we battle it? Well, with truth, we 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 attack arguments. People don't just believe something. They might say, "Oh, well, it's just what I believe," but they believe it because they think certain things. Mm -hmm. And if you address those certain thinking, it changes the way they they act. So. Um, a lot of what you will hear in the secular world around us is, is spiritualism. They use that word a lot. And what they mean by that is feelings. So our, our spiritual life becomes a feeling-driven life. But as Christians, we know that Christianity is actually knowledge-driven. It's about knowing the truth, knowing the living God, knowing what's right, knowing what's wrong, and acting out of that, regardless of the feeling. And when we address issues, that's how we should address it. Attack, attacking it by means of knowledge. Um, I, I really think this is one of the big ploys that, that the devil has done. Um, sometimes when I'm talking to people and I listen to what they say, and I just think, you have no idea of logic. <laughs> you, you can't even put an argument together. Um, and a lot of what people these days think is, I almost want to say quotes of other people's sayings. Mm -hmm. So it's not even that they understand it, it's just this person said it, so now it's true. And then I think, mm, what's the argument? Let's get to the argument. And it's so easy to poke holes in them because they don't really have an argument. You just need to get them thinking. Yeah. Well, my English teacher always said that the, um, the rarest thing on earth is common sense. Yeah, <laughs> precisely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I haven't actually said this so nicely because it says for we walk in the flesh. We do not war according to the world. Yeah. For the weapons of our warfare are not common, but mighty in God is fulfilling our strong yep. Yeah, yeah. It's it's cool. Cool. yeah. Yeah. And it's by God's power that we do it. And that's amazing because we're not just busy with arguments. We are busy with arguments with God's backing. He makes the arguments effective. Um, Francis Schaeffer always told the story of one of the guys that came to the room and he walked with him for two days and they went through all the arguments and at the end of the two days that I was sitting by the fire and I knew, he knew the truth, but he didn't know the truth. It didn't become part of him yet. And the guy was sitting there and he looked at a spider on the way going down and up and as the spider went down, all of a sudden he started crying. 
And he just said, but this is real. And all of a sudden, we started believing. That's God. That's not just our arguments. We can take someone to a point, but God's the one who, who really takes them there and changes them. Okay. So, so the battle that we have is really a battle of thought. It's a battle of, of working with people's minds and their thinking. Um, now, you'll notice the strange wording in the last verse um, where he says, and we will make ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Do you see that weird verse? What do you think that means? Let's look at the next verse. It says, you are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, you should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he did. So what's he talking about? Well, Paul is addressing them. They are at this time the battle that he's fighting. And his battle with them is that they have fallen into false teaching, into heresy. And now he's, he's telling them this is how we fight our battle. But he says, I'm going to beat you guys up in this battle <laughs> because I want to get to the truth and we'll, we're going to bring obedience to the front. <laughs> but he's not going to physically beat them. He, he means by this he's going to, he's not done with it. And, and, and he continues pressing on. Um, this is what he's after. Okay. Any questions about that? Does, does that make sense? Does it also mean that if ready to punish this weakness is to change your thoughts and your actions on your own side? Because I mean, it's easy to say, mm -hmm. oh, God. But we know actually speaking out doesn't work. So, why do all. Yeah. But we're going to look at that just a bit later. That's what I want to show you guys in James, um, where it's about we we start the battle, but we don't really start the battle outside. The battle starts here first before we move up. It's like counseling. The best counselors are the ones who have to counsel themselves for a long time. Then they'll do it. It's the same with, with someone who, who the best apologists are the ones who have to do it for themselves, get, get the battle won in their own hearts. So we're going to get to that. Okay, there's a cost that has to be paid for this type of, of battle that has to be fought. It is a battle, after all. So let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 32. Hebrews 11? Yeah. Um, so, Hebrews 11, verse 32 to about 38, actually it divides into two sections. The first section shows the battle in one light, the other section shows it in another light. Listen to the one light, 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Simon, uh, Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lion, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in the battle and rooted foreign armies. In other words, you listen to that and you think, whoa, what a battle. <laughs> this is a good battle. We will be doing all of these things. Verse hmm. 36. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sold in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. So the battle that we fight, there are these moments where there's that glorious victories. But a lot of the battle exists in, in not glorious things, sometimes in, in, in being oppressed and sometimes in being going through difficulty, in, in being outcast for what you believe. But that doesn't mean we should not be fighting the battle. Both of these groups that we read about are victors in faith. They are, they are heroes of the faith. Um, those with who, who had success as much as those who suffered for their faith. 
um, a lot of times I, I think we as Christians have got this strange worldly idea of success. We think that we are only successful when we have churches that are full of people, when our Bible studies are overflowing, when we talk to people and they just come to faith. Uh, then we think, oh, this is now a real success. But we think that when you spend 40 years talking to one person, trying to get them to faith, and you die even before that happens, that you've wasted 40 years. And you haven't. The, 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 the value of what you do is not determined by us. It is determined by God. That's in Taylor spent most of his adult life in India. He had two converts. But out of his work, there is still today work being done. Was it a wasted life? Just two converts? He must have felt horrible. But it wasn't a wasted life. He did what was given to him to do. But I think this is where that idea of kingdom comes in that we forget. If, if a king asks you to do something, you don't necessarily know what the end result will be. You don't even know why you're supposed to do it. All you know is you need to do it. And you do it. And if it's successful, wonderful. If it's not as successful, well, you don't really know. The real answer is what he wanted to achieve by that. And, and we don't know that. As Christians, we are in the midst of this dark world. We're supposed to be light shining. Some of us will, will work and it will be wonderful. God will give big fruit. Others of us will work and they, they will not be big fruit. But not that we know it. Both of those will achieve God's purpose. And that's all we are supposed to do. It's just to his purpose. And also, we don't know what God's version will be. Precisely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I often think of Spurgeon's conversion. He got converted by a washing lady in the house where he stayed. So, one lady converted one guy. He converted hundreds of thousands of people. She didn't know that. She was just doing what God gave her to do. And that's all. And that's all we have to, to do. So this battle that we fight has cost it. It cost us something to do it. But more than that, this is a personal battle first. Um, I, I get more and more convinced of, of, of this, that our Christian battle is firstly a private battle. Um, I think of prayers, for instance. It, it's easy to pray with a group of people where it's public. Um, it's almost as it comes easier when that happens. But we should pray first yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In, in your house, in your class, very close to you, you're busy really praying to God that when you are actually in the midst of people, it's just the outflow of what happens in your heart. Um, and so with every house in a Christian life, when, when you are discussing the gospel with someone, it should be a gospel that you experience that you know intimately because your life had to go through it you have to suffer these things when you give comfort to someone it must be because you know that type of comfort you needed it before and, and the same with the battle that we have to fight as believers it, it has to start with us if, if we want to address the magnitude of sinfulness and darkness in the world that starts by addressing it personally. Okay. Um, don't make the, the mistake of thinking that you first have to sort out the battle personally completely before you can battle that side. No, that's not what I mean. You, you have to battle both sides, but you have to battle both sides. You can't just battle outside and not inside. So the place I want to take you is to the book of James. Um, James 1, Scribus Yeni. James 1, this is 12 to 15. And this is now where I want to show you that thing of where 
believing something slightly wrong can have a huge effect. Okay, so before I'm going to read this, what is thin and what is thinning? <coughs> What is sin and what is sin? Sin is, is what you do. Sin is what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Sin is the, is the act. <laughs> it's not really the. Not even the act. Yeah. Sin is sin is the thing that's inside of you. It's, each one of us are born with Adam's sin inside of us. Sinning is about. Sinning is the doing of it, but sin is what's inside of you. Okay. Which one is wrong? Okay. Yeah. When they're in by them. No. Okay. Have you noticed that a lot of what you hear these days in Christian circles and then especially in new Christian books is that sinning is wrong, but that sin is okay? Okay. Let me give you an example. What is wrong? The desire to steal or stealing? It's just having given the thought. Okay, and if you read Christian books, what do you find? There's nothing wrong with being same sex attracted. Yeah. That's a very good example of it. Okay, so. And same sex attracted is by the way the wrong word can. In Christian books, mostly you will read. Yeah. So we, we sort of get to people and we try to be kind to them and we try to be more Christian like. And by being that, we actually stop being Christian like. We, we say, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay if you, if you have sin in your life, but it's not okay to act on it. Is that what the Bible teaches? Mm -hmm. The Bible says that we should kill sin in all of its forms. We don't want the action, the thing that's inside of an application, so we should mortify. That's what Romans 8 says. Kill it. <coughs> that is a Christian battle that should happen. Now, the verse that they often use to try and differentiate between the two is this section in James. And I want you to listen to this. This, uh, so it's James 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under the trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, what God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he, when by his own evil desire, he dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Okay, so do you see where they make the little cut? So they say the desire is not the bad thing. The desire, when it is conceived, in other words, when it comes to fruition, that gives birth to sin. You act. That's how they see it. But in James' thought, that whole thing is sin. I almost want to call it the cycle of sin. In other words, James' argument is, it's not that God causes us to sin. It's his argument. He says we sin when evil desires in our own hearts, in other words, in our flesh, comes to fruition. We do it. In other words, where's the evil already? In our hearts. That is already, how do you kill outward sin? You kill it inside. Okay. In other words, if you are a person who loves stealing, you're a kleptomaniac, you love stealing, the act of stealing is wrong, yes. But the desire to steal is already wrong, and you should be killing it. And as a Christian, we know we can. That's what Christ died on the cross for. We can subdue the evil in our lives by the desire already. So what Tom said is not very good. So now we say to people, it's fine. You can come to our church. You can 
feel attracted to other people of the same sex, uh, because you were born that way, it's not really an argument. Um, and it's fine because um, as long as you don't act on it. What's the problem? We're not addressing the sin. Mm -hmm. The sin is that you were born in sin. Yes, that's why that desire is there. But in Christ, that desire can be cured. It might take time. You might still battle with it for years. But Christ can change your desire. That's what it means to become a Christian. It changes your heart of your study to a heart of flesh. It gives you new desires. So fight the desire in the first place. And then what happens when your life changes? I think you know, of, of that meme, you always see it all over. Be kind always, <laughs> always be kind. Yeah. But when you think of it in the way you're describing it now, you are also endorsing sin because you are being kind to people where you should actually be teaching them that it's wrong. So, so that's a good example. Um, kindness in biblical sense is looking after that person. Mm -hmm. Providing them with food, helping them, giving them comfort, all of those things. But it doesn't mean heresy. Real kindness is when you grab a person, like James would say a bit later, uh, uh, you know, James would say a bit later on, a person out of the fire to save them. Our world is under fire. A person who's homosexual. What's the bigger kindness? Giving them food or pulling them out of sin so that they do not end up in hell? I think that's, no, that's real kindness. I think what happens is that the church has been indoctrinated by the world. Mm -hmm. We think kindness means acceptance, unlimited acceptance. Where kindness really means we, we want to help you. In what your real need is, not what you're thinking. And that is also where the human rights come in, because yeah. human rights is one of the top guys. You can't yeah. do this. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, everybody's got the right to do something. Yeah. 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 And give more of what you have. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't mean we disengage from them. No, no, no. Yeah, and the thing is, we should engage with him. Yeah, we should engage with him more, but without compromising. In other words, we invite them to our houses. We are kind to them. They come and eat with us. They visit with us. They do all of those things with us. But they know what our, what we believe, and they know what our purpose is behind it. So you do it for the next six. I will do. No, I, I do not agree with the, the battle that's against. Um, yeah, I think he's right. I think he's right. <laughs> Let's first continue. We're going to get back to something similar so we can talk about that. But yeah, so I, I, I think in this case, Christ says to us, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. In other words, be innocent always, be holy, but be scheming to get the truth to people. That's the, the word that's used for wise, scheming. In other words, as Christians, we should be glad to have people in our houses. It's the right thing to do. It's good, it's an honorable thing to do, but we have a purpose behind it. We want those people to get to know the cross. That's our purpose. I was going to say this thing, and actually, I have a care that comes to me, and we had this discussion in the week about the overpopulation of the mm. background, and a um, person has the right to their children. And I said, no, a married person has the right to their children. <laughs> And then the living room they will hide married food. So I'm actually glad that I have to be staying back. No, you have to. And and I did say what I what I said. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the thing is it's a battle. Um and it's a battle we 
the first punch was in was thrown by us. Now, if, if it was a battle where we threw the first punch, by all means. But the punch has been thrown. We just responded. And we're allowed to do that. We have to do it. So it's good. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's turn to Romans chapter 1. So we know we're in a battle. We know that this battle rages in our own hearts, firstly. And as we battle with ourselves, we have to battle outside also. We know this is a battle about truth. So we need to address things for what they are, really. We, we, we're not playing with fads. We're busy with real substantial things. Okay, so in Romans 1, we find Paul's method of viewing the world. Um, and if we can understand how to view the world, we can understand how to address it. This, what I find in, in Romans 1, I think is the core issue. If you understand this issue, all the rest of them fall inside of this. Okay. So, um, Paul addresses an issue. He, he starts in verse 18, and he says this. He says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness, uh, godlessness and wickedness of men, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to see, because God has made it plain for them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without any excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified them as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But they, thinking, became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Okay, in other words, what is the big issue in our world from that? The issue is that mortal man suppress the knowledge of God, the truth of that. It, it's blatant for them to see. So no one in the whole world, Romans is very clear about it, no one in the whole world stands at a place where they can say, I didn't know there's a God. Because it's so blatant to see. Everybody knows there's a God. Even if they deny it, then they are denying it. They're not, not seeing it. Okay? And what do they do? Instead of following the living God, they choose, I almost want to say, earth religion. So instead of worshipping the transcendent God, they worship earthly things. Um, and he, he listed there, he says, um, they make images of, to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. In Paul's thought, there is only two religions. There is the Christian religion, which is true, and there is all other religions. They are all the same. The Christian religion is the only religion in the world that worships the transcendent God. All other religions, and I really mean all other religions, worship the earthbound religion, the earthbound God. Um, there's a guy called uh, Peter John J um, Peter Jones. He, he gave it names. He, he calls it oneism and twoism. So he says Christianity, the Christianity is a twoism religion. In other words, there's a created world and a creator. And although he is Outside of the world, he's also inside of the world, but he in the world is separate things. If if the world stopped existing, God continues existing. He, he's not bound in that way to the earth, but to the world. Where the earth religions view everything as one. Think of the Roman gods. Are they outside of the earth or inside of the earth? Inside. inside. They live in a high place, but they're still inside of the earth. Um, Hinduism, same thing. Uh, Buddhism, well, they either, the earth is the God. You know, it's just spirit everywhere. Um, Islam, yes, a trick one for you. Islam, is that? Well, even if, yeah, well, well, even if, if they worship Allah, is Allah inside of outside of the world? It's also a question. He is in the world. Why? Well, because he had to create something because he was lonely, it becomes part of him. God didn't create because he was lonely, he created because he's a father who loves. 
he makes. But it's not him, it's not part of him. Where the world is part of Allah. If the world stops existing, Allah will die. He can't live without the world. He needs the veneration of the world. Um, so in, in that sense, for Paul, there's only these two religions. And if you can understand that, you can understand what's going on in the world around us. Okay. Um, what the world is pushing for is oneism. And by oneism, they mean uniformity also. Um, so although you have all of these different religions, they're trying to force all religions to be the same. Um, even though you've got all of these spiritualities, they're actually all the same. They're working towards the same thing. And all of a sudden, all differentiation changes. It moves away. Um, in our world, you're not allowed to be a man or a woman. There mustn't be a difference. You're not allowed to um, be um, exclusively this or exclusively that. Everything must just melt together into the melting pot. Everything must just be one. We, we as Christians say, no, 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 there's two. There is a creation and a creator. And the creator is the one who determines the creation. He, he makes a thing male or female. It's not a choice that you have. It is something that he made. And therefore, we live according to it. Um, there is one right religion. All religions doesn't lead to the same place. There's one right. And we stand by that because there's one living God. See, this difference between a world where everything is inclusive, included in one, and a world where everything is separate, makes a huge difference. That's where our real battle is going on at the moment. It's there. It's absolutely If you just think about all this one world religion, yeah. one world finance, one world everything is one world yeah. and, that, and that is also what uh, the Lord says that are in, 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 in uh, revelations yeah this well that's just that thing once yeah you form the one world of everything yeah and the thing is the moment you remove the moon of God out of the picture God becomes in, in, included in the world there's no absolute truth in it I can have my truth you can have your truth and it is of the core value mm -hmm. but as Christians, we say, no, there is an absolute truth. There is an absolute moral standard. And that's the place from where we work. We cannot accept homosexuality because there's an absolute God who said no. Um, and it doesn't matter if you care or not. It doesn't matter if you agree or not. He does not change because of us. He's separate from us. His moral standard is the moral Standard. So that's how we should work as Christians. What happens to us as Christians is we sort of buy into oneism without even realizing it. Um, we start thinking, yo, oh, it's okay if I think this and that person thinks that, and I can believe this and I can believe that. And we're fine. But we're not. Because there's an absolute truth. And we as Christians have to hold to that. Um, I don't think we must just look at it as the, this one world religion and that's what I'm trying to be sad because there is an elite group of people yes. and yeah. that's the second group and then there's Satan mm -hmm. who takes over that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I agree with you, but, but with, if you look at the media, all everything these days are pushing it down the throat. Yeah. You know, all this one yes. everything needs to be sad. So, yeah. you know, so we, we are really about it. Yeah, no, we are. Now listen to the result of this. So he explains this is what's happening in the in their thinking. They've decided to turn away from the living God, worship earth religion. What's the result of that? Listen to this. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them over into their sinful desires of their hearts. To sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve creative things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. In other words, because they do not worship God, what happens? 
God gives them over to their deprived mind. They are given over to their sinful lusts. They do the things that, that it's sinful and they think it's okay. And they even go deeper than that. Now they really turn against God. And they worship the created beings. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even the women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received the, uh, in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to remain, uh, retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to praise mind to do what ought not to be done. They were becoming, um, become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderous, God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey the parent parents. They are shameless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these three things, but they also approve of those who practice. Isn't that just a picture of our world? <laughs> it's stages. Mm. Although, therefore, yeah. because yeah. Of it flows God, over. So God is therefore giving them an opportunity to repent. Yeah. Also, yeah. otherwise, the judgment, which is all these things of judgment, are going to be. Yeah. So Paul's, Paul's telling us this is not to tell us this is just what happens. Paul is using this as an argument to show the, the glory of the gospel. In other words, a person might be right at the end of that, still hear the gospel and turn away from it and turn to God. So that might still happen. But it just becomes worse and worse and worse. So as Christians, what should we expect to find in the world? Well, this. They've turned their hearts away from God. This is what we ought to expect. We, it shouldn't surprise us when we find it. What is the remedy? The gospel. The gospel is the remedy. So if if we if we know this is what we find in the world, we know what they need. They need the gospel. We do not accept these things. And this is what the church has been doing now across the world. We've been accepting these things. We've been accepting crazy things as okay in an attempt to get people to church. But that's not our task. Our task is to get them to Christ. And the only way you get them to Christ is by not accepting these things, by showing them for what it is. And then you can turn them to Christ. A, a, a sick person doesn't know they need a doctor unless they are sick and they realize they are sick. A person who lives in this depravity of mind needs to figure out that they are in this depravity of mind before it becomes to us. Um, that is our task. That's our work. So this is the worldview that we need to have in mind when we are working with people. When we are working with people who are not Christians, the problem is they've turned their backs on God. And they are living in the punishment of that turning their back. And what they need is Christ. And they don't know. Yeah. But this is what we need to do. Okay, so does this make sense? We've done quite a lot today. <laughs> okay. So it's important for us to, to, to call sin, sin. And to, to call sin, sin. Um, you, think that they move into the heart. Not. In the window. Okay, but then we should be able to get to them. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, we should be calling sin, sin. We should be stating what it is, for what it truly is. And pray that God will use that as a means of changing people's hearts. Um, the church is not in a place, we're not in a neutral ground. We're not in a place where we can sort of have this wonderful thing of sometimes it's okay to just be okay with things. We're in a battle. And at the moment, 
So that all is very much against us. We've, we've given too much ground, and now we need to get to a place where we can to start taking ground back. Mm -hmm. Do you even know if it is a small fiction or short title? You would understand the story too. You, there was a Labour Party from Holland to do. She said, After you die, you can change your gender. <laughs> 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 yeah. So the thing is, when we when we work with people in this way, what they need to realize is their mortality, mm -hmm. and they need to realize it. Those are the two things we really have to work with. Yeah. I still want to be clear with every day how little people know how their bodies work. That's number one. Do you want, want to tell them about those things for me? Yeah, we can do that. Um, let me switch it. Why are you switching? Okay.